the haunting plea of Elizabeth's ghost. I threw myself into the research with renewed fervor. I scoured through more records, searching for anything that could substantiate her innocence and perhaps bring peace to her tormented spirit. The deeper I delved into the archives, the more I realized how much was at stake. This was not just about a single wronged soul. It was about a multitude of spirits, all intertwined in a web of tragedy and injustice. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the floor of my study, I uncovered a particularly damning piece of evidence. A letter, hidden away in a forgotten ledger, detailed a conspiracy among the town's leaders to rid themselves of what they called undesirable elements. Elizabeth, with her knowledge of herbs and healing, had been an easy scapegoat. The realization of such calculated evil sent chills down my spine, and I knew that I was now a part of this story, whether I liked it or not. As I sat in the dim light of my lamp, pouring over the yellowed pages, the air around me grew oppressively cold. My breath fogged in the air, and I felt a presence behind me. I turned slowly, half expecting to see Elizabeth or one of the other spirits, but there was nothing there, only the oppressive sense of being watched. The following days were marked by an escalation in paranormal activity. I heard footsteps pacing the hallway at night, the floorboards creaking under the weight of invisible feet. Whispers filled the corners of my rooms, spilling out secrets long buried. And always, there was the feeling of cold, as if the very warmth of life was being sucked out of the air. Driven to the brink of despair, I contacted a medium, a woman known for her ability to communicate with the other side. Her name was Mrs. Blackwood, and she agreed to visit my home, intrigued by the intensity of the haunting I described. Mrs. Blackwood arrived on a stormy night, the wind howling like the anguished cries of the damned. She was a small woman, her face lined with the knowledge of countless encounters with the beyond. This house is a nexus, she declared as soon as she stepped inside, a conduit for spiritual energy, both dark and light. We set up in the living room, the only light coming from the flickering candles we placed in a circle around us. Mrs. Blackwood began to chant in a low, sonorous voice, calling to the spirits trapped within the walls. The candles flickered as if in a breeze, although no windows were open. The temperature dropped, and I saw my breath cloud in front of me. Suddenly, the room went completely dark as all the candles snuffed out simultaneously. A silence descended, heavy and oppressive. Then, all at once, a scream tore through the darkness. So loud and so close, I covered my ears in pain. When the lights flickered back on, Mrs. Blackwood was staring into the corner of the room, her face pale and drawn. They are all here, she whispered, her voice trembling. So many, trapped, so much pain. I followed her gaze and saw them. Apparitions, dozens of them, crowding the room. Men, women, children, all of them with the same hollow-eyed, gaunt expressions of the forsaken. Elizabeth was among them, her eyes meeting mine, bleeding. You must finish this. Elizabeth's voice echoed in my mind a whisper among the cacophony of the other spirits. Reveal the truth. Set us free. Mrs. Blackwood and I worked through the night, documenting the appearances, the voices, capturing evidence of the paranormal manifestations on video and audio. As dawn broke, casting a pale light through the windows, the medium slumped back, exhausted. The energy is diminishing, she said, wiping sweat from her brow. You've made contact, but the rest is up to you. You must tell their stories, bring to light the truth of what happened here. 
Only then will they find peace. As she left, I turned back to the room, now silent and empty of spirits. I knew what I had to do. I began to write, not just the story of Elizabeth, but of all those who had suffered alongside her. My words flowed onto the page, driven by a newfound purpose, to give voice to the voiceless, to champion the truth. As I wrote their stories, the air around me felt charged, as if the spirits themselves were hovering, reading over my shoulder, ensuring their tales were told accurately. Each word seemed to alleviate a fragment of their pain, a subtle lightening of the heavy atmosphere that had suffocated my home since my arrival. Yet, the closer I came to finishing, the more intense the manifestations became. It was as if the darkness was making one last desperate stand to maintain its secrets. The final night before I planned to publish the account, the house was restless. Doors slammed shut without wind, whispers cascaded down the hallways, and the air was thick with the scent of old, forgotten things. Mold, decay, and fear. I was determined to finish, my fingers flying over the keyboard, the clock ticking towards midnight. As I typed the last sentence, the room went deathly still. The oppressive weight that had hung in the air lifted suddenly, and I realized I could breathe easily again. I leaned back, exhausted but triumphant, and then I heard it, a soft, collective sigh, like the wind passing through leaves. The spirits were thanking me, I realized. I had fulfilled my promise. I submitted the manuscript online, detailing every dark corner of the settlement's history and the tragic fates of its inhabitants. I included the paranormal evidence Mrs. Blackwood and I had gathered, making a compelling case for the truth of my experiences. As the story went live, I felt a final shift, a release of energy that seemed to cleanse the house. For the first time in months, I slept through the night, undisturbed by any whispers or spectral sightings. When I awoke, the house was bathed in sunlight, feeling more like a home than a mausoleum. I walked through the rooms, half expecting to encounter a cold spot or see a flicker of movement in the mirror, but there was nothing. The spirits had moved on, finding the peace that had eluded them in life. Days turned into weeks, and the calm remained. People from all over the world responded to the publication, some with skepticism, others with belief and similar stories of hauntings and unexplained phenomena. Investigators and historians visited, adding credibility to the account and confirming the evidence I had presented. But the true confirmation came one evening as I sat reading in my living room. The air shifted, and I looked up, half expecting the return of the unsettled spirits. Instead, there was a soft glow in the corner of the room, and within it, the figure of Elizabeth. She was no longer the tormented soul I had seen in the mirror. Her expression was serene, her eyes kind. Thank you, she said, her voice clear and calm. You have given us peace. With those words, she faded, the light dissipating with her. In the months that followed, my house became a place of historical interest rather than paranormal fear. Visitors often commented on the peaceful atmosphere, a stark contrast to the stories they had read. I continued to research and write about other historical mysteries, but the experience with the Hawthorne Lane spirits remained the most profound of my career. And sometimes, late at night, when the wind howls just right, I can hear what sounds like whispers of thanks carried on the breeze. I smile, knowing the spirits are at rest, their stories told, their existence acknowledged. They are no longer forgotten shadows of the past, but remembered souls 
who had once lived, loved, and suffered. The horrors of Hawthorne Lane had come to an end, not with more darkness, but with light and understanding. In telling their stories, I had not only freed the spirits, but also liberated myself from the grip of fear. The house on Hawthorne Lane stood no longer as a beacon of terror, but as a monument to the power of truth and redemption. Ever since I moved into this weather-beaten cottage on the outskirts of Hawthorne Lane, I felt uneasy. The ancient trees, with their gnarled branches, seemed to claw at the windows when the wind howled, casting eerie shadows that danced on my walls. My nearest neighbor, Mr. Talbot, lived a mere stone's throw away, his home equally shrouded in mystery and ivy. The first time I met Mr. Talbot, it was under the dim glow of the street lamp. His eyes, sharp and penetrating, seemed to look right through me. You're the new tenant, I presume, he asked, his voice raspy, as if he seldom had use for it. Yes, that's right, I replied, trying to mask my nervousness. I just moved in last week. He nodded, almost imperceptibly, and then turned away, disappearing into the fog that seemed perpetually settled over his home. As days turned into weeks, peculiar occurrences began to manifest themselves. It started with whispers, barely audible, that seemed to echo through the halls at night. I would wake, heart pounding, unsure if I had dreamt the sounds or if they were real. Then, items began to move, a book here, a face there, always slightly, always just enough to make me doubt my sanity. One evening, as dust crept over the landscape, I decided to confront Mr. Talbot. I needed answers. He answered the door on the third knock, his face half hidden in the shadows. What brings you here at this hour? He asked, his tone devoid of surprise. I need to talk to you about, about the things happening in my house, I stammered, my voice faltering under his intense gaze. Ah, uh, he said, a slow smile spreading across his face. You've noticed them then? His casual acknowledgement of the disturbances sent a chill down my spine. What are they? I demanded, trying to sound braver than I felt. Why are they haunting me? Mr. Talbot's smile faded, and he looked out into the gathering darkness. Not haunting, he corrected softly. They are merely curious. You see, this land, these houses, they are old very old. They have memories, stories to tell, and sometimes they choose to share them with the living. I was about to ask him another question when a sudden scream pierced the night. It seemed to come from his house. Mr. Talbot's expression didn't change. You should go now, he said, his voice suddenly urgent. It's not safe for you here when they are restless. I hurried back to my cottage, the screams still ringing in my ears. That night, the whispers were louder, more insistent. I couldn't sleep. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, jumping at every creak and moan of the old house. The next morning, I found a note on my doorstep. The handwriting was shaky, almost illegible. Meet me at the old well in the woods at midnight. It read, all will be explained. T, despite every instinct screaming at me to ignore the note, curiosity overcame my fear. I had to know what was happening, why it was happening. Midnight found me by the old well, the moon casting long sinister shadows through the trees. Mr. Talbot was already there, his figure obscured by the darkness. Thank you for coming, he said, his voice a whisper. What you are about to see may terrify you, but it is necessary. He 
he lifted a lantern, illuminating an old, rusty chain attached to the well's winch. With a creaking groan, he began to turn it. Slowly, the chain pulled up what appeared to be a large, heavy object from the depths of the well. As it emerged, my breath caught in my throat. Hanging from the chain was a large, antique mirror, its surface fogged and speckled with age. The glass seemed to swirl with a smoky, liquid darkness as if it were alive. Mr. Talbot set the lantern down and gestured towards the mirror. Look, he commanded, his voice a mix of fear and fascination. Reluctantly, I stepped closer, peering into the glass. At first, I saw only my own reflection, pale, wide-eyed, filled with terror. Then, the surface rippled like water disturbed by a stone, and another face appeared over my shoulder. It was a woman, her features twisted in a silent scream, her eyes hollow pits of despair. I spun around, but there was no one behind me. When I looked back, the face was gone, replaced again by my own terrified reflection. This land was once a settlement in the early 1700s. Mr. Talbot began, his eyes not leaving the mirror. A small community isolated from the world, plagued by misfortune and loss. Many died here, their spirits restless, angry, bound to the place of their suffering. He paused, his gaze penetrating. They communicate through what they left behind, like that mirror. It belonged to Elizabeth, a young woman accused of witchcraft, who died by this very well. The air grew colder, and I wrapped my arms around myself, trying not to show my fear. Why are they reaching out to me? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Sometimes, Mr. Talbot said slowly, a spirit takes a liking. Or perhaps they sense a vulnerability. Elizabeth was wronged, terribly wronged. Maybe she sees something in you, a way to communicate her story, to seek justice through you. The thought of being chosen by a vengeful spirit sent shivers down my spine. I wanted to run, to leave this cursed place and never return, but my feet were rooted to the spot. What does she want from me? I asked, dreading the answer. That is for you to discover, Mr. Talbot replied, his voice ominously calm. But be warned, delving into the past, inviting these apparitions into your life, it comes with a price. Are you willing to pay it? Before I could answer, the wind picked up, howling around us like the cries of the damned. The mirror's surface rippled again, and this time, dozens of faces appeared each contorted with anguish and sorrow. I staggered back, my heart pounding, as the faces began to whisper in unison, their voices a cacophony of misery and rage. Help us, they moaned. Free us. I covered my ears, trying to block out the sound, but their voices penetrated deep into my mind, echoing in my skull. Mr. Talbot grabbed my arm, his grip iron tight. You must go now, he shouted over the wind. Go before they ensnare you completely. I ran, not stopping until I reached my cottage. Once inside, I locked the door and collapsed against it, my body shaking. The whispers followed me, however, slipping through the cracks, filling the room. Help us. Free us. The following days were a blur of sleepless nights, and haunting visions. Faces appeared in mirrors, windows, even in the surface of my coffee. Their whispers grew louder, more insistent. I tried to ignore them, to continue my daily life, but the specters were relentless. Driven to desperation, I visited the local library, searching through old archives and dusty domes for any mention of the settlement or Elizabeth. The librarian, an elderly woman with sharp eyes watched me curiously. You're digging into some dark history, she warned, her voice tinged with unease. Some secrets are meant to stay buried. But I couldn't stop. I found 
found old maps, diaries, and court records, piecing together the tragic story of the settlement. Elizabeth had been a healer, loved by some, feared by others. When a sickness swept through the settlement, she was blamed, tried as a witch, and executed near the old well. As I delved deeper into the history, the paranormal activity intensified. Objects flew across rooms, doors slammed shut, and the temperature would drop so sharply that my breath turned to mist in the air. One night, as I sat huddled under blankets, a figure appeared at the foot of my bed. It was Elizabeth, her face sorrowful, her hands reaching out to me. You must tell my story, she whispered, her voice echoing around the room. Expose the truth, set us free. I nodded, too frightened to speak. As she vanished, the air grew warmer, the whispers quieter, but I knew this was only a respite. I had a task to complete, a story to 